And we are on to our final storyteller, and we have a special treat for you. He is a science writer. He is the director of the MIT program in science writing. He's also the author of Newton and the Counterfeiter, about Newton's life uh, trying to thwart international counterfeiters. This is true. It's awesome. You should all read it. And you should all give a warm welcome to the stage to Tom Levinson. It's uh, 43 years this month since my father died. And no, I'm not going to talk about that accident tonight. Um, but he's been much on my mind lately. And I've been thinking a lot about one line in an essay he wrote, uh, trying to explain what had been, at the time, the mid-1940s, a really unorthodox decision to make the study of Chinese history his life's work. And he wrote that, I turned to China for the promise of wide open spaces and the long road home. Wide open spaces and the long road home. I love the sound of that. But at 19, when I first read it, I had basically no clue what he was talking about. Uh, and it was important to me at the time because I was a sophomore in college and I was trying to figure out what I was going to study. And I had just about to study China and Japan because, of course, they were so interesting and there was this you know, wonderful rich field and all that. And the fact that by doing so, I could then read my dad's books under the tutelage of one of his own teachers and a bunch of his buddies from graduate school, I'm sure had no bearing on the decision. I mean, of course, the motives were so obvious, I think even I got a glimpse of them. But so what? You know, sons chasing after absent fathers is an old game. And in the event, I got lucky, because China and Japan are awesome subjects. And it's fantastic history and wonderful things to learn, and I had a great time in college. It's just, a, it was, I mean, luck, but it was a great choice for me. So much so that, that by the time I graduated from college, I thought, well, Whatever folly there may have been in my original choice, why not? Maybe I should just be another nice Jewish boy going into my father's business. <laughs> so immediately after graduating, I went off to Japan and you know, just tried to immerse myself, seeing if this would work. And that's where I really discovered a problem. I don't know how many of you remember the um, Harlem Globetrotters, but um, there was this team they played, I think it was called the Washington Generals, though my main, you know, I won't vouch for that. But anyway, the Washington Generals were great, except they never, ever, ever won a game, right? And that was me, and the Harlem Globetrotters were Japanese language. And after a few months of really beating my head against that one, I finally figured that, yeah, this isn't going to work. I really need to regroup and rethink. Well, I was already over there on the western side of the ocean, so, you know, early 20s, single, no particular responsibilities, why not wander around the Pacific Rim for a while? And that's how one day, for absolutely no good reason, I found myself getting off the plane in Manila Airport in the Philippines. And when I say no good reason, I mean, I knew nothing about the Philippines. I mean, read the newspaper from time to time, um, didn't speak Tagalog, didn't know the geography, I mean, I knew nothing. I had one friend in town, which meant that I had a place to stay. And then I had another stroke of luck, which was that the bureau chief for the Reuters wire service bureau in town had just for weird reasons had to fire both his local reporters. And one thing about wire, I don't know how many of you are journalists, but wire service work, the one thing you have to do is feed the wire. It needs copy, it needs copy all the time. And this poor bureau chief sitting there alone was dying, you know. He needed any warm set of ten digits to hit the typewriter. And so he was willing to accept politely the fiction that one year of work on a college newspaper was sufficient training to become a foreign correspondent for Reuters. And he <laughs> pointed me to a typewriter and said, you know, that's your corner of the office, you know, go to it. He wasn't above a little bit of hazing, because on my second day at work, I had to then go do the story that they hand to cub reporters just for fun. And uh, that was, in this case, a sad story. A, a young woman, an American Peace Corps volunteer, had that morning been shot, killed in a street mugging. And I said, go out and get the story. So I went out and got the story, and I found a friend of hers. And I asked her a question that you're really supposed to know how to ask rather better than I did. I said, so how did you feel when you learned your best friend in the country had just been gunned down in a pointless street crime? And she answered me. How do you think I felt? Just like that. How do you think I felt? As if there was something more to come, right? Well, she's going, how do you think I felt? Now I felt bad or whatever. No, how do you think I felt? Beat, beat, beat. 
And I realized that I'd actually had the complete answer. There was just one part that didn't need words to convey. And what had really been just said to me was, how do you think I felt? Asshole. <laughs> well, I survived that lesson. Um, but it was still a problem to be a reporter for Reuters in Manila, given the fact that I knew nothing about the Philippines. And, you know, I mean, I knew that they probably did a brisk shoe business back then in the Marcos era, but that was about it. Um, and I was looking for a way to get stories that were a little bit more substantial than showing up at some, you know, room with a government official saying something and writing it down and putting it on the wire. And then one day, in what is truly the single biggest stroke of luck in my entire career, my boss dropped a press release on my desk and said, there's a coral reef biology conference coming to town. Go cover it. I said, sure, he's the boss. Uh, I was a little perturbed because, of course, my knowledge of the Philippines was the Encyclopedia Britannica compared to my knowledge of coral reefs and their biology. But, you know, okay. So I showed up at the conference on the day it started, and I realized my first thought was, boy, did I make a much worse career choice than I had thought. Because I was surrounded by hundreds of just beautiful human beings, physically fit, tanned, gorgeous men and women with this glow about them. And, you know, and why shouldn't they glow? They'd figured out how to make other people pay for them to go for several months of the, of the year to the most beautiful spots on Earth and go scuba diving. <laughs> you know, after I recovered from my why didn't anybody tell me moment, um, I started talking to them. And that was when it hit me. You know? These people had come to the Philippines, many of them were Filipino scientists, and they knew something. They knew a really specific something. They could, you know, they could tell you what the productivity of this reef was, or what the impact of human activity on that reef had been, or how species diversity was thriving or not, or you know, whatever it may have been. They knew specific things. They had measured them. They had counted them. They had pieces of the truth. You know, that was something to hang on to. I didn't necessarily know who was doing what to whom in Manila city government. But I knew that the reef off that small island that had just been studied by this team of Filipinos and Australians was behaving in this way. And what's more, I knew something more. That there were human actions impinging on, all, on this all the time. That there were decisions you had to make about your reef if it was in one shape or another. That there were ways that fishermen were trying to save or, or exploit their reef. All kinds of things, didn't matter what. But there were facts that you could rely on that were real. And there were human actions all around them that you could interpret with a much greater sense of clarity than I had ever experienced in trying to cover City Hall or what have you, because there was something real that their actions could be measured against. And I said, the science stuff is cool. And it's more than cool. The science stuff, these moments when you get bits of truth, whatever the science may be, whether it's directly, you know, environmental science is very easy to connect to other human things, but there are all kinds of ways to connect almost anything you can imagine to the way people organize themselves around some new idea. And I realized the story I'm trying to write at this Coral Reef um, conference is not, you know, 500 scientists came from 30 countries to talk to Manila about coral reefs. It was, you know something about the coral reefs, you know something about the society or the politics or the culture or the human emotions that occur around dealing with whatever it may be going on. I said, aha, I can write this story. And I can write this story over and over again. And I can write this story about forests, I can write this story about physics, I can write this story about studies of the brain, because human beings react to something new, and it tells you something not just about the new fact, but the person reacting. I said, this is great. I had no idea I could do this in journalism. These are wide open spaces. Wide. Thanks, Dad. That's good. I thought I went to Asia to find out, you know, follow Dad's recipe. You go study China, you have a nice time, you have wide open spaces, and you write about China. And I didn't realize that what Dad was saying was not go study China, it was go find wide open spaces. And I figured I was an adult for taking that long to figure it out, and very lucky that I was still just 23 or 24 and could enjoy what has been just a wonderful career doing that stuff. But I still had the problem of the long road home. I didn't get that at all at 23, 24. I'm not sure I fully get it now. But it took more than 20 years for me to begin to get a handle on it. And I started to do that one January morning in a, a part of England that's actually not very much different from the one uh, John told you about at the beginning of this evening, uh, in Lincolnshire, also in the flat, boggy east of England. And I was standing with my back to a 400-year-or-so-old stone farmhouse. 
uh, looking across a little farm lane to what was the sorriest excuse for an apple tree I think I've ever seen. Sort of this flat trunk, the fallen trunk, and this sort of spindly new trunk that had come out in some few branches. Um, and I was there really just to prove to myself that a part of a very famous story was real. Because this was the apple tree that is the most famous apple tree in history since the one Eve hung out under to her woe and sorrow. Um, because the farmhouse behind me had belonged to Isaac Newton. That's where he grew up. And the apple tree in front of me was all that's left from what by pretty reliable provenance, I mean, I could tell you now all the details about how they know it's Sir Isaac's tree, but take my word for it, uh, is the tree that Isaac himself said many, many years after the fact that he'd been looking at one afternoon when it came to him that apples always fall straight down towards the center of the earth. They don't fly off to the side, they don't go up, they always fall down in the same way. And as he told this story in his great age, well into his 80s, 60 years after this realization is supposed to have happened, that was when he realized that there were the, se the seeds of what would ultimately become his theory of gravity. Now most Newton scholars think this story is fictitious, that Newton has a constructed memory or was making up a story or what have you. And you know, I agree that this, the fact that there was 60 years between the event and the only time Newton ever mentioned the story, long after he'd done all the work on gravity and so forth, you know, it's unlikely, vanishingly so, that Newton actually sat there in the yard one day and said, ha, I've got it, apples fall, gravity, it's all done. Um, but I, I kind of, I went there almost as a pilgrimage because I wanted to understand, even if it was a false memory, why had Newton told that story when he was 85 or 86? And I spent some time trying to find out, and ultimately I bit the bullet and actually tried to read the Principia, Newton's great book, uh, which is not what you would call a beach read. 